Before you can know what the signs and symptoms of pneumonia are, you first have to know what pneumonia is. Pneumonia is a broad term that refers to inflammation in the air sacs of the lungs, the alveoli. So when doctors are using the term pneumonia, it's generally referring to an infection that is causing that inflammation in the lungs, although in reality, not all pneumonia is caused by infection. The most common types of pneumonia are caused by viruses and bacteria. So for the purposes of this video, we can refer to pneumonia as a viral or bacterial infection that causes the alveoli to become inflamed in which they fill up with fluid and other nasty stuff. For example, those alveoli can fill up with mucus and pus. Pneumonia can range in its severity. It can be anywhere from mild to serious, and it is actually a very common cause of death. It's most serious for infants and young children and people over the age of 65 and those with underlying health problems, especially those with weakened immune systems. Bacterial pneumonias are still among the leading causes of deaths due to infectious disease, despite the widespread use of antibiotics. So the signs and the symptoms of pneumonia can vary from mild to severe, depending on the age, the overall health status, and of course, the specific cause of that pneumonia, the specific virus or the specific bacteria. So I'm gonna start out by describing pneumonia symptoms in general, and then I'm gonna describe the classic symptoms of pneumonia for each of the most common bacterial causes. The most common pneumonia symptoms include cough, especially coughing up phlegm, chest pain that is made worse when you take a deep breath or you cough or you sneeze and this type of chest pain is known as pleuritic chest pain then there's fever sweating and shaking chills feeling short of breath fatigue and other fairly common symptoms include nausea vomiting diarrhea loss of appetite headache and body aches now for adults over the age of 65 it's pretty common for them to have confusion or changes in mental awareness and they can have the opposite of fever, so lower than normal body temperature, especially for those who have weakened immune systems. When it comes to newborns and infants having RSV infections, they're more likely to have trouble breathing, wheezing, and their cough is much more likely to produce lots of mucus. For most adults, the classic symptoms of what we call community-acquired bacterial pneumonia go like this. There's an abrupt onset of fever, cough, which starts out as a dry cough, but within a couple days starts producing mucus, and it can have blood in it sometimes, which is usually nothing to be concerned about. Uh, but also, they become short of breath and have that pleuritic chest pain. As the infection progresses, especially if it's a bacterial pneumonia, and that person hasn't received antibiotics, there's a very high potential for that person to develop severe respiratory distress and for the bacteria to cause the body to go into septic shock. And that's why we often see so many patients in the ICU with this life-threatening pneumonia and associated sepsis and septic shock. While the symptoms I just described help support the diagnosis of pneumonia, symptoms alone are not enough to make the diagnosis because pneumonia is common and its symptoms overlap with many other illnesses. This includes things like acute bronchitis, influenza, pulmonary embolism, congestive heart failure with pulmonary edema, lung cancer, aspiration pneumonitis, vaping lung, bronchiectasis, just to name a few. So to make the diagnosis, we try to get more clues through the physical exam findings, through blood work, analyzing the sputum sample from that stuff that you coughed up, even looking for certain things in the urine, and most importantly, chest imaging, whether that be a chest x-ray and sometimes a chest CT scan or chest CAT scan. Then we take into account all the above mentioned clues including symptoms, and try to piece those together in order to make the diagnosis. The most obvious clue is what the chest imaging shows, whether that be the chest x-ray or the chest CT scan, but even then, chest imaging isn't always perfect. Chest imaging is indicated for the majority of patients with suspected pneumonia, not just to help make the diagnosis, but to also assess for the potential complications, such as an abscess that can form in the lung, as well as a collection of pus that can form around the lung, known as an empyema. Or maybe it's not pneumonia after all, and we discover the real diagnosis once we look at the imaging. Or maybe someone has more than one diagnosis at a time. For example, many times patients with lung cancer, they come to the hospital because of a pneumonia that developed as a result of having lung cancer, something known as post-obstructive pneumonia. The presence of an infiltrate on x-ray or CT scan, meaning you see that density there, that white density. When you see that, that's the gold standard for diagnosing pneumonia when taking into account those other factors, those other clues like symptoms and so forth. So findings consistent with the diagnosis are low bar consolidations, interstitial infiltrates, and or cavitations. Those are all radiographical terms. In some cases, a chest x-ray may not be sufficiently sensitive for the detection of pneumonia. 
So if there's a high clinical suspicion despite a normal looking chest x-ray, the options at that point are to just go ahead and give that person antibiotics or you could do a chest CT scan depending on the circumstances. Of course, we don't always do chest CT scans because that's giving radiation to people and we don't like to give people unnecessary radiation. Now let's look at the classic signs and symptoms for each of the five most common causes of community acquired bacterial pneumonia, which is number one, streptococcal pneumonia, AKA pneumococcal pneumonia. The classic symptoms of pneumococcal pneumonia are sudden onset of a very high fever, chills, and a pleuritic chest pain. If the fever is not treated, the temperatures typically are 39 to 40 degrees Celsius, which is 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which is exactly what my temperature was when I was sick with pneumococcal pneumonia back in my 20s. It was the highest fever I've ever had in my life. The first symptom that I had was actually headache and later developed the chills, cough, and shortness of breath. And also with this is a very fast heart rate. Now, when you listen with a stethoscope, the breath sounds are diminished in the area of the lung that has the pneumonia. And you also hear some abnormal or funky sounds there called rowls. Chest x-ray shows the very dense homogeneous infiltrates that are clearly delineated with air bronchograms. And they take about four to eight weeks before they go away. Microscopic analysis of that nasty putrid sputum with this bacteria it reveals the bluish purple colored gram positive diplococci. So basically the gram stain, when you add it, it makes them turn this uh, blue purple color and uh, in the shape and how they arrange in chains, that's indicative of streptococcal pneumonia, streptococcal bacteria. In hospitalized patients, when we do blood cultures on patients with streptococcal pneumonia, one third of the time their blood cultures will turn positive, which show these bacteria coming from the blood. Staphylococcal pneumonia, that accounts for 5% of bacterial pneumonias in the outpatient setting. Both streptococcal and staphylococcal pneumonias can occur as a complication of influenza infection. So if someone has the flu, maybe they start getting better and next thing you know, boom, they got a new pneumonia and they're getting worse. Chances are it's either streptococcus pneumonia or staphylococcal pneumonia. Both these types of bacterial pneumonias generally have an acute course of a very high fever. Abscess formation is a fairly common complication when it comes to staphylococcal pneumonia. Mycoplasma pneumonia is estimated to cause 30% of community acquired pneumonia cases, most commonly seen in kids and young adults, especially because they spend a lot of time in close proximity to others. These symptoms usually start with headaches and general malaise, so generally just feeling like crap as well as fever. Now the cough is usually a dry cough and there can be associated symptoms of a sore throat, runny nose, congestion, and actually ear aches. You could actually get ear infections with mycoplasma. And there can sometimes be joint pain and a rash. Chest x-ray in this case usually shows bronchopulmonary infiltrates, so it's typically gonna be both lungs that you're seeing those infiltrates. As if chlamydia causing an STD wasn't bad enough, it can also cause eye infections and yes, pneumonia. In this case, symptoms may start acutely with a sore throat and a hoarse voice. Legionella pneumonia occurs by inhalation of aerosol of water containing the bacteria known as Legionella. Symptoms at the beginning of the disease include fatigue, malaise, joint pain, and headache. Then one to two days later, you get fever, dry cough, pleuritic chest pain, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea to go along with sometimes belly pain and abnormal brain functioning where you start seeing neurological signs. The main thing that's peculiar about Legionella is that diarrhea is a much more common symptom compared to the other types of bacterial pneumonias. Chest x-ray in this case typically shows patchy homogeneous infiltrates and in half of the cases there's a pleural effusion where fluid builds up around the lung. A nice thing about this bacteria is that it usually produces an antigen that can almost always be detected in the urine, which means that a diagnosis can be made within hours. There are, of course, many more types of bacterial pneumonias, viral pneumonias, fungal pneumonias, and pneumonias that aren't even caused by an infection. In fact, I only covered about 1% of all the different types of pneumonias that exist. Making the diagnosis in some cases is very easy. And in others, it can be very difficult. In one study, 17% of the patients who were hospitalized with a community acquired pneumonia were ultimately found to have a different diagnosis. The most common alternate diagnosis in the study included heart failure with pulmonary edema, cancer, 
in a pulmonary embolism that was associated with pulmonary infarct, meaning a clot that went to the lungs and it caused a blockage of blood flow to the point where part of the lung would die off. Now, pneumonia is the world's leading cause of death among children under the age of five and is the most common reason for a child to be hospitalized. There are 120 million cases of pneumonia per year in this age group, and more than 10% of these pneumonia cases progress to severe illness. Now, for U.S. adults, pneumonia is the most common cause of hospital admissions other than women giving birth. Half of the deaths from pneumococcal pneumonia occur in the age group of 18 to 64. With that said, those who are over 65 years old have a higher risk of getting pneumonia and are more likely to die from it if they do get it. So while not all pneumonia ends up being serious, it's definitely not something that should be taken lightly.